Now welcome to another edition of News from Naboo with Thor's Lightning Takes. And let's get right to the news. All right, interesting story I think today. This news came out just last night. Mandalorian is going to be on broadcast TV. Just like Andor. Following, yeah, following in the veins of the success that Andor, I think, having those first three episodes premiere on TV and on Hulu, I think that helped with their Disney Plus overall numbers, and it must have done something for them if they're going to now copy that with The Mandalorian. Yeah, it tends to say that Andor had a, a bump or boost of some kind. Though who out there hasn't seen The Mandalorian? Apparently at least some people if Disney's going to go to this length. Because they're only going to air season one, episode one. <laughs> Chapter one. The Mandalorian. Yeah. Say hello to Grogu. <laughs> and uh, if you want to see the rest, please sign up for I Disney+. Mean, Plus. that first episode is pretty phenomenal. Yeah, it, it's... it's got all the things that are going to catch your interest and really hook you on the series and then leave you hanging out in the dust. Well, yeah. I, I just wonder how many people don't really know about the mandalorian or haven't seen it or haven't heard about it how many people i think people have heard about it but well, how yeah, many of them I... have actually gotten to sit and watch it without having to subscribe i don't know i i don't know that there's a huge number of people who haven't seen the mandalorian that would really want to see it I mean, maybe i'm i'm wrong i don't know it's... you're probably wrong i think there's a slew and I think this is going to be a reason for people to share it with your, you know, like how we put out that Thanksgiving, share and or with your family and friends. Sure. This is, hey, you know some that one person in your life who hasn't seen Mandalorian? Well, they don't have an excuse not to watch it now. I guess. Now they can watch episode one, fall in love, and subscribe to Disney+. Ha 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 ha. Yeah, but I, I've said before, I think it's kind of transcended Star Wars. I think it already has a pretty big following. I don't know how many people are, are yet to get on board the... Uh, Mando train. I don't know. Maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they'll see a, a big boost, but I don't know. It, it is peculiar. I mean, this is going to be on Friday, February 24th at 8 p.m. Eastern Time on ABC, Freeform, and FX, simulcasting across so, all of those. So you're going to have like four or five days to see that first episode, subscribe to Disney Plus, and then watch two seasons and yeah. a couple Binge Mando 2.5 in uh, Book of Boba Binge Fett. Binge it. Binge it. That's what's going to happen. I don't know. I think it's very interesting. There's a couple of issues I've had with Disney Plus right now. Netflix, after X amount of time, used to, and they still might. I must not. I just don't always pay enough attention. They would put all the stuff out on Blu-ray DVD after like two years or something of being a Netflix original. Disney Plus has not done that. If you want to watch The Mandalorian, you have to be a subscriber. They haven't released it to disc yet so that you can just go and go, oh, well, I'll just buy it if I want to own the first season and watch it whenever I want. Uh, as far as I know, like nothing that's been an original to Disney Plus has become something that the mainstream audience can buy. Does Netflix still do that? I know that you could at one time buy season three of Stranger Things on disc, and I know that they, they used to do this, but they haven't done it as far as I know recently. I just find it very interesting that... Disney is passing up on that form of revenue, hoping to get subscribers for the long haul. I wonder if that speaks to the possible success or health of Disney+. Plus. Maybe. I just think I think they're worried about people instead of just ever getting Disney+, Plus if the discs get out there. It's just easier for people to kind of bypass that. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily even buy it, but to borrow it or whatever it might be. Right. But what do you think that means for the success of Disney+, Plus? the fact that they're going to pretty much... They're put, they put Andor out there... And now they're putting Mando out there. It's almost, it's like begging for subscribers. But yet they didn't do this with any of the Marvel series or any of their other projects as far as I know. I don't know. I, I understood it with Andor because I think Andor was something that they mm -hmm. were like, this is really good. This is getting really good critical reviews, but, but not no, a lot of viewership. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that's the same with the Mandalorian. Mm -hmm. Mando doesn't have that problem. No, Mando not, is like huge. I, like I said, they didn't do this to any of the Marvel shows. What has got them into this set that they need to put this on their, their TV shows channels to drum interest to come back. I mean, they're putting their most popular Disney Plus show out there for regular viewing, knowing that they're just it is, this is a ploy to try and get people to subscribe to their service, who somehow haven't already. The only thing I can think of is that Andor was such a huge success after, not a huge success, but that it did, like we were talking about before, mm -hmm. there was a major boost 
that they're hoping to just kind of reap the same benefits again. Like this is another test run where we tested it with something that wasn't doing so well and yeah. this boosted the numbers. Now we're going to test it with like our flagship Disney Plus series yeah. and see what happens. Because this could be then a trend for them henceforth, putting an episode of something that they're they're currently running or about to run out to the mainstream TV to see if you know if they can lure more people into their service. One of the last things I heard is they weren't getting the numbers that they had wanted yet. Not that they weren't getting bad numbers, but that they weren't getting the subscribers across the board that they thought they'd have at this point. Yeah, I've, I've seen a lot of kind of reports that streaming is uh, not as profitable as any of these kind of companies who have been diving in have thought it was going to be. Well, part of it's because the market is so saturated with streaming services. Yeah that it makes it a little rough because there's only so much streaming content to go around and people will just pick and choose at this point. Yeah, you don't need like 10 different services. It's it's kind of a crazy competition. But Disney wants to make sure that you are one of, you know, they are one of the ones that you do need. Yeah, it feels like there's Netflix and then there's a few others and then mm-hmm. there's even a few others. You know, there's different kind of tiers. Where, yeah, with certainly yeah. Netflix still Netflix being the king. Netflix is still the king. And then Hulu is always doing really well. And then Disney got Hulu. I think um, Paramount Plus and Peacock are, you know, they're a little more down on the tier bar. But then everything has. Yeah, there are other ones. That, I mean, there's other smaller ones and just everything has a. And some of them, there's just not a lot of content on there, especially, again, when you can compare it to like a Netflix. Right. Netflix has had that crown for so long. They've got deals with some of the companies that after they've sprung up their own you know, streaming services, well, Netflix still has rights to their projects and they're not giving it up. Yeah, I feel like there's no reason for Disney not to do this. Why why not put the first episode of a of a series out there? That is an advantage that they have over Netflix. That they own a lot of different networks. Mm-hmm. Whereas Netflix doesn't own any unless I'm missing something. No. Netflix doesn't own a TV <laughs> station <laughs> yeah. that they can own. Well not a TV have. station, but there might be some kind of cable ch- I don't know. I haven't watched cable. Netflix or satellite relies in entirely on word of mouth and reviews for its big series that nobody will have heard of. I mean Stranger Things got them subscribers because of word of mouth so to speak and critical reviews it wasn't because they put the first episode up where anyone could get access to it disney is trying another approach which could turn out to be extremely profitable for them like i said there's no reason not to do it why not why not throw them out there one episode here one episode there Mm -hmm. of a series and maybe you get someone to bite and at least throw it on a couple dollars to check out your streaming service and then maybe they stick around maybe Either way, we'll see how this affects Disney Plus in the future to see if they keep following this this trail of breadcrumbs down and, you know, what they're going to do with their I streaming won't be, service. I won't be surprised if this is a, a new kind of trend for them. But that being said, if you do have anybody who hasn't seen The Mandalorian yet, <laughs> February 24th, ABC, for free. Freeform, FX, Friday, February 24th, 8 p.m. Eastern. You can give it a try for That's somebody it. to watch it who hasn't. All right, we'll move on to a um, easier topic than today. Steven Spielberg's Amblin TV and Imagine are working on a Williams documentary. John Williams, the king of music, the king of song, composer extraordinaire. How was it? Not I'm sorry, I was yet. doing some gestures, which you were. Yeah, well, I saw them. Yeah, <laughs> they were spared. You know, the legendary composer who did Star Wars, Jurassic Park, Indiana Jones, Harry Potter. He, he's just done so many things that everyone throughout the years knows. Recognize his music. He's worked with Steven Spielberg on so many projects, most recently The Fablemans. They're like lifelong friends, Steven Spielberg and John Williams. And now Spielberg is going to honor his friend with a documentary on his life. It doesn't have any title yet. It's in the very early stages of production. And Spielberg's executive producing it. I wonder if John Williams will be doing the score. <laughs> <laughs> doing the score of his own documentary. Yeah, but... Or they'll just use some of the music of his, you know, of his life. <laughs> no use in him having to do new stuff, even though he still is uh, still doing new stuff. He kind of retired and then unretired. and mm-hmm. Like, why? He's just like, why would I retire? I mean, I'm 90, but why? He's I, like, I, hey, if my friend's still going strong, I'm, yeah. I, I can keep going. I mean, Spielberg had this to say about his connection with his friend John Williams. I don't think we've ever had a disagreement. I mean, what am I going to do? Sit down and write the music myself? No. No. No, you are not. No, you not are anywhere not. anywhere like him, no. <laughs> Got our own composer in the background, it sounds like. Yeah. Cat composers. Cat composers. All right, originally we thought that Spielberg was going to be done with Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, but he's pretty much said, I'm not retiring. 
He says, you know, I got I got to keep working. Got to find out what what, he, what I'm doing next. And he just he just wants to keep doing it. You know what? And that's that's great. He's got such a rare skill that I'll take anything he composes. Yeah. And he's still he's still got it. I mean, at 90, you know, a lot mm-hmm. of people don't have it. They've that lost their edge. That theme for Kenobi was brilliant. I've heard that the I haven't heard it, but I've heard that the music in the Fablemans is of course Williams worthy. Williams esque. Williams, well, it is Williams, so it can't be Williams esque. <laughs> I suppose, huh? You know, he even composed music for the Olympic Games. You Which know, one's the? One of them. I don't. All of them. <laughs> I'm just gonna say all of them. Do you want to know where his career composing music started? Where did it start? Gilligan's Isle. No. Yes. He started his career composing music for TV, beginning with Gilligan's Island. I don't even believe you. Yep. Gilligan's Isle. The original pilot theme was done by Williams. I don't believe it. (laughs) You do believe it because we paused so that we could go and listen (laughs) to it. That was terrible, though. Well, you know, it was made in like 1964. He was a strapping young lad back then. He wasn't really that young. It's the funny part. Strapping young lad, I mean, sticking be, with it. He'd be young, much, much younger, but mm-hmm. he still wasn't like a young, young man. But honestly, who better to helm a John Williams documentary than someone who's worked with him for 50 years as a friend and a collaborator? Yeah. Perfect. Oh, cool. I mean, we'll certainly check it out when it uh, rolls around. I mean, that's, that's just going to be something to see. That's going to be really interesting. I'm curious how it'll go, what we'll see, what we'll delve into in the life of the legendary king. Composer, Will they John mention Williams. Gilligan's Island? <laughs> Will they mention Gilligan's Island? I hope so. Oh, I hope not. Uh, all right, well, that is all we got for you this time. A little bit of a fun news day, I suppose. So do take to the comments below, and uh, let's talk some Star Wars. Tomorrow we'll be uh, talking some Bad Batch, so if you want to leave a comment over on the other channel's review of it, maybe we'll read it in tomorrow's video. Whatever the case may be, leave a comment somewhere. Let's talk some Star Wars. And until next time, thanks for watching.